gifts and souvenirs such as fruit, flowers, sweets and postcards. The atmosphere around the temple is lively and boisterous. The interior of a Hindu temple is not designed to hold large congregations. Worshippers come and go in small groups through a hallway leading to an inner sanctuary. Here, the image or symbol of the main deity is located. In an active temple, statues of the deities are covered with garlands and draped with rich fabrics. Above the sanctuary rises a central tower, often brightly painted. Hello, namaste. Uh, you are able to hear, sir? The shape you're of the tower hear? resembles the mythical mountain here. home Okay, wonderful, of the gods. wonderful. Thank you. I got a Other video features on the YouTube. of temples include okay. sacred okay. bathing ponds, okay, sir. Okay. 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 and Hindu gateways in series. a variety okay. of shapes <laughs> and sizes. As a filler till 3 p.m. Okay, sir. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Right. Namaste, sir. Here, at Madurai in southern India, the gateways tower above the temple complex and are covered with statues. Some temples are no longer in active use. At Khajuraho in central India, tourists now flock to see celebrated images of gods and loving couples adorning the exterior walls. In Konarak, near the eastern coast, are the remains of one of the largest temples ever built in India. It was dedicated to the sun god Surya. The original tower no longer survives, and we can only imagine its size from the smaller buildings that still stand. The immense variety of temples throughout India is the result of local styles and preferences and centuries of architectural developments, each attest to the artistry of countless masons and sculptors. The sculptures of deities seen in the Asian Art Museum were once part of an active Hindu temple. They adorned the exterior walls, interior spaces, entranceways, high wall niches, and inner sanctuaries. Health enhances smiles. Good oral health contributes to overall well-being. We at Group Pharma, our purpose is to deliver the best dental and healthcare products and services. We are constantly innovating to offer the finest in our sphere of the industry. In our 40 years of existence, we developed and launched many first-time products like Bioactive Glass Toothpaste, the unique Xylitol-based Kids Toothpaste, the Phytoenzyme Toothpaste and the Nano Hydroxyl Appetite Toothpaste. We have made a significant impact in alleviating specific oral conditions. Our dedicated field force, supported ably by our energetic and enthusiastic back office experts market the products manufactured at our CGMP and ISO compliant factories located in Bengaluru and Mumbai 
our oral hygiene products helping healthy smiles across the globe our commitment to spreading smiles beyond business we have the legacy of partnering with the community and with every smile we realize our purpose we symbolize the two most important beliefs we have growth in every aspect and the people we touch we at group pharma live our purpose of delivering the best oral and healthcare products with the firm conviction that every healthy smile matters Hindu temples can be seen throughout the villages, towns, and cities of India. A temple can be a simple structure by the side of the road or an entire complex of buildings. Regardless of its size, the Hindu temple is essentially a dwelling place for the gods. A principal deity resides at the heart of each temple like a king or queen in their palace. Other deities, attendants and mythical figures 
can also be seen as part of the temple structure. Surrounding the temple are stalls selling offerings and souvenirs such as fruit, flowers, sweets and postcards. The atmosphere around the temple is lively and boisterous. The interior of the Hindu temple is not designed to hold large congregations. Worshippers come and go in small groups through a hallway leading to an inner sanctuary. Here, the image or symbol of the flower. Just one more minute to begin. Hello. Yeah, sure, sir. Definitely. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. And we keep it for one hour duration, right? The entire thing. Uh, yeah, I'll uh, do the onboarding. I'll start exactly at uh, 3 p.m. And okay. I'll uh, drop off at around 3, 9, 3, 10. We have only 13 attendees as of now. I hope okay. over the next five, 10 minutes, at least some of them will come in. Uh, okay, that's uh, not a problem. Uh, but they'll also see the recording later on, right? Yes, yes. They will all get yeah. the replay recording. Okay. okay. Correct. Uh, other uh, people on the panel can put their video on. It will be nice. Uh, uh, Joshi Saab is here. Dr. Raven Joshi. Uh, he will not be there today. Okay. Hello. So, ma'am, uh, shall I start? Yes, I think, yeah. Because it's already start. three. I'll start my onboarding process. So, warm welcome to all the presenters. Thank you very much for joining in. Early birds, you're all welcome. And as we go ahead, I think more and more people will join in. Before I start, I request all the presenters to just uh, give a wave of hand and uh, introduce themselves. So, uh, I can start here. Can you please self-introduce yourself? Arjun, you can introduce yourself first. Ah, namaste, everyone. I'm Arjun Bharadwaj from Bangalore. I currently work as uh, uh, a contributing ed editor for Preksha Online Journal. It's an, uh, a journal of uh, several articles we publish every day on different aspects related to Indic studies, Indian studies, such as uh, arts and aesthetics and literature, philosophy. We publish several books. I have authored uh, quite a number of books as well. I'm an engineer by training. I did my uh, B.Tech in NIT Suratkal and master's in ETH Zurich in Switzerland. And I have also got a master's in the Sanskrit language, German and uh, Greek and a couple of other things. So this uh, studies related to temples is one of has been one of my long term interests, and I would like to thank uh, every each one of you for giving yeah. me this opportunity. For uh, yeah. uh, thanks for the short introduction. Uh, I you. request everybody to provide a short introduction, sir. You're on. Please present yourself. I think you are muted, sir. Just unmute yourself. Am I audible now? Yes, yes, doctor. Yeah. Continue. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, today's webinar. I'm Dr. Girish Rao. I'm uh, a consultant uh, maxillofacial surgeon. I also happen to be the president of our uh, SASOMI. Um, um, really glad that uh, we are having uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Arjun Bharadwaj today on this uh, uh, seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Girish Rao. Now I request madam, I think she's from Japan. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. I'm basically from Bangalore itself, uh, residing here in Japan from the past uh, last 15 years. Uh, I've done my basic PhD, I mean, uh, dentistry in Bengaluru. And then I moved after I moved here, I did some research and later I did my PhD here in the uh, subject of oral implantology. I'm part of the SASOMI. I'm the vice president of this group and uh, looking forward to having more webinars and interacting with all of you. And thank, thank you to Sri Arjun Bharadwaj for uh, uh, accepting this uh, uh, invite and uh, doing us the honors. Thank you. Thank Madam, you. how do we say thank you in Japanese? How do Arigato gozaimashita. Oh, that's a mouthful. I don't think I can make it. I wanted to say that to you. Okay, I'll just say ditto. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Now I'll go to respected <laughs> sir. Uh, Dr. Shapu, sir. 
Yeah. I'm a practicing prosthodontist and implantologist. I practice in Bangalore. I've done my uh, BDS in Davangiri uh, in Karnataka and uh, my MDS from uh, JSS Mysore. No, I, I am very happy that actually Dr. Bharadwaj is uh, presenting the today's seminar. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, I don't think anybody else is there. Uh, sir is there, but he has put his uh, uh, video off. Sir? Ah, yeah, please yeah. Uh, introduce him. Now, now I am audible. Yes, yes, audible and visible. Yeah. Please, sir. I am Dr. Ma. Yeah, yeah, I'm Dr. Nagesh, former principal at RV Dental College and the advisor to the Sasome group. Thank you, Mr. Bharadwaj, for accepting the invitation. We look forward to a very fruitful presentation and interaction among the attendees. Thank you again. Thank you very much. I'm Sunil Chiplunkar. I'm working with the Group Pharmaceuticals as VP Business Development. I have also done my MPharm, Pharmacology, MBA, Marketing, PGD, HR. I'm currently doing my PhD. And I'm happy there's one more JSS CPN here. Uh, I did in pharmacy uh, B Farm there, sir. Okay. So nice meeting you. <laughs> nice okay. The, uh, going besides uh, going beyond prejudice, let me start. Warm welcome to everybody. Thank you very much for being here. Dentists, of course, are known to make the world a better place, one smile at a time. So I am Sunil, and I would like to introduce you here some interesting features about what dental practice can do and how beneficial it is. I am sure some of you will be knowing the names of these uh, of this actress so tulsi babu sir is also there yes anybody else can tell me what's the name of this actress you can type your name here type the name of the actress here it starts with j julia, julia roberts Everybody? julia yeah, roberts yeah it is julia roberts of course and if you see the smile of julia roberts it's a picture of contrasts we will see what is the difference between the two smiles well, for this, we have to look at the study which was done at Mills College in Berkeley. So they studied the class photos of the girls. In that class photograph, some had a genuine smile. Others were having a non-genuine smile. So what is a genuine smile? It's one which is involuntary and reaches up to the eyes. So there is a crow's nest normally when a person genuinely smiles. And the researchers tracked down these women 30 years later. They found that genuine smilers were blessed with happier lives in terms of marriage, well-being, and career. So what we say is that the Ducheni smile or the genuine smile, the authentic smile is very, very important, and we need to support it always. And here you can see the features of the non Ducheni smile. So it's up to the lips. It does not go up to the eyes. And here you can see the crow's nest, which is forming. And it's all involuntary. Huh? You can't fake a genuine smile. Now look at this beautiful uh, aerostas. Looks like she is smiling at you and alluring you. But if you look at it, it's a Pan Am or a Botox smile or a false smile. It doesn't reach up to the eyes. It's the typical smile which a aerostas gives, you know, when you enter. Namaste, welcome, welcome. And you are carried by that, but that's not a genuine smile. Even here, it's a beautiful smile, but it's not an authentic smile. So I'll present my favorite smile, and that is the seductive smile. And I will say, please watch the proceedings. They are very interesting. The genuine smile comes from the heart, but a healthy smile needs good dental care. And the smile is a very important uh, way of interacting with people. It is the most studied facial expression, and smiles are normally used in the interpersonal interactions. You always look better when you smile. It is seen that in research, the inability to effectively smile increases one's risk for depression. So it's very important to smile, to be always alert, especially in this pandemic era and avoid depression. Every time you smile, there is a feel-good party in the brain because this activates the neural messaging and gives you more health. And there is the benefits of the release of neuropeptides, you know, the dopamine, endorphin, serotonin, oxytocin, all these, you know, when their happy chemicals goes up, you feel better. By the way, we have given for all the attendees certain PDFs. You can download it for free. One of them is Happy Chemicals. You can read that. Then there are other interesting aspects also, including on post-COVID. It's all downloadable for free. Please download it and enjoy these PDFs. Get informed. After all, information is power. You see this pretty child smiling, right? 
we all like it when children are there and babies are there because they are all smiling and makes us all happy well there is a reason for that children smile up to 400 times a day as per studies happy adults smile 40 to 50 times a day and the average adult smiles only 20 times a day so you can imagine how depressed we guys are well there was a baseball card study which was seen and the correlation was observed between the smile as well as how long the patient or the person would live the people who smiled the longer or the more they lived up to 7 years longer so what it means is that smiles are very important and they should be authentic smiles the face research laboratory at university of aberdeen scotland were asked to rate smiling and attractiveness they found that people who make eye contact and also smile they were found to be more attractive so obviously the smile is a very powerful way of attracting attention and being an attractive personality when the picture of a smiling person was presented the researchers asked the subjects who were there in the study to frown and they found it very very difficult to frown when they saw a smiling picture in the swedish study so what it indicates we got to smile and it's the dentist who is the smile and success creator you may under, wonder why because smile and success go hand in hand so always go to your dentist regularly understand that the dentist is a personality development person he is going to improve your facial index he is going to improve your smile index the smile value and he is going to help you in not only improving your socialization and social skills but he will boost your confidence in fact child development will be reduced if there are oral care problems if the child doesn't know or has certain inhibitions due to the oral care issues she or he will not smile he will not socialize well learning behavior is affected executives you need to go regularly to your uh, dentist because the face is the index of the mind if your oral health is there and it's a pretty smile that you are sporting then your executive success is guaranteed for emotional quotient improvement again smile is important because what is emotional quotient empathy as well as social skills if you want to improve your eq or your emotional intelligence become a better husband or a wife or a parent and also to strengthen your learning behavior visit your dentist to will improve your social well being and your smile quality so oral health is fundamental to overall health well being and quality of life this is what the australian government says there is also a facial feedback hypothesis what it is saying is that if you smile then you get better happy chemicals in your brain and if you have better happy chemicals then you smile more so it's a two way street so please learn to smile and partnering you all including the dentist to make healthy smiles matter is group pharmaceuticals with its excellent range of products which include the shy xt shy nm which is all bioactive glass toothpaste which we are offering the fluoridated one is called elsens and in this season we have seen improvement in omnident acceptance merely because it is for healthy gums and today if the gums are unhealthy cavicular fluid comes out then it may add to the viral load so omnident is very good for healthy gums and we have fresh chlor which is stabilized chlorine dioxide which reduces the viral load and that's essential as a pre chair procedure and also for the subjects including the patients opd to reduce the viral load in the oropharyngeal tissues always please ensure to have contact less greetings namaste is the best and remember one thing a dentist is not a person who just takes away your dental pain that is one part of it his contribution or her contribution is in fact life changing consult your dentist he will change your destiny by boosting your smile value and confidence thank you very much and uh, now i will go ahead on to a very interesting uh, slide show it will just be a flash it is about the sasomi so what does sasomi me stand for madam can you add your words here from japan you can unmute yourself ma'am you are muted yeah please speak ma'am uh. Yeah, yeah. South Asian Society for Society you please speak. Yeah. Yeah, it's a short form for South Asian Society for Oral Maxillofacial uh, Implantology. We yes. in Sasomi we have a vision and uh, a mission where we bring about uh, a collaboration between Indian dentists and Japanese dentists 
and uh, uh, you know like uh, uh, <laughs> sorry to see if there are any research possibilities yeah. uh, workshops and any yeah. kind of uh, advancement in the academics also yeah correct you have written here ma'am that it is to yeah. contribute for promotion of oral health in south asian region and to promote clinical research and training in the areas of oral and maxillofacial surgeries yes. there's a yes. there's a ray there are a lot of people here who currently are in our panel also like dr Hello. girish and dr nagesh Hello. who are here dr girish rao would you like to add some Hello. words here you can unmute yourself sure um yeah. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, this um, fifth webinar from Sasomi. And thank you, Group Pharmaceuticals and Mr. Sunil, for that wonderful introduction which you gave us. Uh, mm -hmm. It's heartening that uh, today we all want uh, a lot of serotonin, a lot of dopamine, and mm -hmm. a lot of endorphins, which really makes us happy, especially at Hello. this point of time when we are all going through so much Hello. of, um, you know, uh, worldwide depression because of. Uh, uh, the COVID-19, which has uh, created such a ruckus all throughout uh, the world. Uh, that is where we conceptualize uh, this idea of having uh, webinars. In fact, uh, we are having uh, uh, every month um, two webinars. One is on the technical aspects and the other basically is on what we call as the Bharatiya pa Parampara, where we try to get in a lot of, um, you know, very, very innovative things which people have um, actually um, really gone into uh, you know from different aspects and you know showcase the whole world that what a great culture we have had and this is probably the oldest civilization which still has you know so many beautiful things which are still there and we have our vedas itself which is probably more than 5000 years old and today we are going to have a wonderful wonderful session by uh, mr arjun bharadwaj who's going to talk to us on the science, the philosophy, and aesthetics of the Indian temple ecosystem. Uh, just to give you a brief thing about Sasomi, Sasomi was launched uh, last year by uh, two very, very senior and well-respected uh, dental professionals. One is my guru, Dr. K.S. Nagesh, who has been uh, the guiding force from the Indian side. He always wanted to bring dentistry to the forefront. He has been a champion on that. And we have had um, Professor Sito, who is uh, probably one of the greatest maxillofacial surgeons uh, from Japan and has made such a huge impact all over the globe with his innovative kind of solutions in the field of oral and maxillofacial surgery. Both of them have trained thousands of graduates and postgraduates who have really taken our profession into a higher level. Now, this is where we wanted to bring in a very, very close link between the two countries, India and Japan. And thanks to our dear friends, uh, uh, Dr. Suhas and uh, Dr. Srilata Bhargav, both of them who are in Tokyo, who made it happen to bring the synergy between India and Japan. It's not just the science of dentistry, but we want to bring in a cultural impact and a holistic kind of uh, you know, uh, joint projects which we would like to do, wherein we have uh, a lot of exciting things which we would like to do. First of all, it's the student exchange program, staff and faculty exchange program, taking on to programs such as over the shoulder programs to observation programs to, uh, you know, exchange programs, both clinically and in research and to take on even to go in to do even PhD programs between the two countries. That's the whole mission with which we have conceptualized Sasomi. And um, um, hopefully we are uh, planning to have a, a, a online conference early next year, probably end of January and the first week of February is what we have uh, actually had. This is also going to be a very, very exciting opportunity for practitioners to showcase their work between the two countries. And you will have most eminent uh, personalities from both the countries and across the globe presenting their kind of cutting edge research and clinical skills, which they have done over the years for the betterment of our profession. So I Thank do you. hope you guys will enjoy the program today. And uh, thank you again, uh, Mr. Arjun Bharadwaj, for coming in. And, uh, you know, it's so heartening to see that you being an engineer has taken up this passion of taking up, uh, you know, on temples and Sanskrit and German. So I think that is something which we would like to encourage in this uh, group also. And that's why we wanted, uh, you know, various kind of uh, programs like this. Um, sure, you will have a great time today. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Girish Rao. That was very spontaneous and very eloquent. Uh, describes your commitment to the mission of Sesomi. Congratulations to Sesomi for doing such a wonderful job, not only with respect to the technical side, like you said, but also with respect to the uh, cultural aspects, which is also very important. Dr. Nagesh, sir, are you there? Dr. Nagesh, sir, uh, I think might have lost uh, contact due to certain technical issues. So here are the various uh, programs which Sasomi is indulging in, including the study tours. That will be very interesting uh, for the PG students who would want to uh, go in for study tours, exchange tours, etc. So I think there's going to be a new level in which uh, Sasomi is aiming. So they are going in for not only the cultural uh, revolution in a way, but also technical aspects are being strengthened. Now I request uh, Madam to introduce formally Mr. Arjun, and then he can take over. I will put his uh, uh, PPT later. Yeah, you can unmute yourself. Please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Sunil. Uh, yes, good afternoon to everybody, and welcome to Sasomi's webinar on uh, Bharatiya Parampara series. And today's topic is the science, philosophy, and the aesthetics of Indian temple ecosystem by Sri Arjun Bharadwaj. Um, so uh, now all the introduction has been already done. So I'll just give a brief introduction to Sri Arjun Bharadwaj. He's a writer, a translator and engineer from Bangalore. He holds a master's degree in uh, Sanskrit as well as in engineering and is also qualified in the German and cla classical Greek languages. He currently works as an assistant professor for Indic studies at Amrita Vishwa Vidya Peter, Bangalore, and is also a contributing editor for literature and arts on Preksha online journal. His research interests lie in comparative aesthetics of Indian and Greek art. He enjoys composing poems in classical Sanskrit and often collaborates with dancers and musicians to make productions. Arjun has translated books authored by Dr. S. L. Bhairappa, Dr. Ramaswamy, and uh, Dr. R. Ganesh, Dr. D. V., uh, D. V. Gundappa, and Dr. Krishna Shastri. He has also authored uh, books which are soon to be published. So I have personally had the privilege of attending some of his courses on Indian temples and have been exposed to his immense knowledge on Indic studies. So now I invite the Sri Arjun Bharadwaj to share his insights on the science, philosophy, aesthetics of Indian ecosystem. Uh, Arjun Bharadwaj, please, uh, you can continue. Thanks a lot, Sri Lataji, and thanks a lot to everyone here, all the dignitaries, for giving me this opportunity to share a bit of my learning and the smiles that the temple ecosystem has brought on me. I'd like to share smiles, like Sir was saying, the importance and the, uh, the spreading of happiness in whatever limited capacity that I can. Uh, just a quick question, How at what time do I need to conclude, including the question and answers? Should we end it by 4 o'clock? What's the idea? I can keep it however short, I can elaborate it. So if I can know the optimal time, I'll Sir, you plan, as I said yesterday, for about half an hour, you can. Start. Okay, okay, all right. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to talk about the Indian temple ecosystem in brief, its structure, its philosophy, aesthetics, and uh, such other things. Like uh, Sri Lataji mentioned, there's a 35 hours course in total that we have been doing online. So just to condense all of that in 30 minutes, it's going to be quite tricky, but uh, let me see how well I can do it. So I just, okay, yeah. Just a moment, yeah. So let us start with the definition of a temple. Most of us think that the temple is the house of God or it's the most uh, famous textbook definition of a temple is that it's a religious structure like the church or the mosque. So this is what we are usually taught in the schools that it's the house of God and it's a religious structure like the church or the mosque. But however, let us see what the Indians have to say about the definition of a temple. So I'm going to use it quite a lot of Sanskrit because Sanskrit is the mother of all Indian languages and that's the language which is native to the Indians. So nobody needs to get scared looking at so much of Sanskrit text I've used here. All of us can definitely quickly connect to all of these principles probably because a temple is a living entity for us. It's not just an external structure. 
So the word in Sanskrit for a temple is Devalaya. But for us, Devalaya or the house or residence of God is not just an external entity. It's not just a structural thing that we today conceive as temples. There is this very beautiful statement from the Ishavasya Upanishad, which says, Ishavasya midam sarvam. It means that the entire world, the entire universe is divine. It is inhabited by divinity. So God resides in every object. There is nothing for us which is not divine. So therefore, temple is not a specific place where we go to, to find God. God or divinity in the Indian conception, in the native Indian conception, which is lastly called the Sanatana Dharma, can be found anywhere. See, it's only in the Indian culture that we worship tree as an embodiment of divinity. We worship plants and animals as embodiments of divinities. We worship every object in the house. If you just think about the Navaratri festival, which is soon going to come, you have the Ayutha Puja there. So every object starting from the, from the laptops to uh, phones and uh, uh, the scissors and knives and uh, TV and uh, all uh, your vehicles, everything is worshipped. There is nothing which is not divine for the human mind. So that, that already shows the philosophy with which we work. All of us feel that we are very small part of this big and infinite creation. The infinite nature of space and time is always there in the back of our heads, in our subconscious mind. And we submit ourselves to this some higher spirit in a sense. So I'm sure that dentists will certainly be worshipping several of their uh, technical elements during the Ayudha Puja. They find divinity with the tools with which uh, they would be working on, um, if I'm not wrong. So we find this philosophy everywhere. There is nothing which is not divine for us. See, it's only in the Indian culture that we worship the footwear of people. We don't call it footwear, but we would call it Paduka, Paduka Puja. So there is, like I mentioned a couple of times already, there is nothing that is not divine for us. So therefore, the temple is not merely an external structure. Anything can be a Devalaya for us. Anything can be a uh, temple for us. We can realize the essence of a temple in a tree. We can realize the essence of a temple in a mountain. We can I realize the essence of a temple in a Triveni Sangama, in the sense of two or three rivers meeting together. That's a divine place. That's a Tirtha Kshetra for us. And in fact, the word Tirtha is used for elderly people as well. Our parents are embodiments of divinity. Divinity lives in, by, in them. So in fact, several languages, we have the word Tirtha Rupa, Tirtha Rupini for, uh, for mother and father. So they are also divine. So there is another very interesting statement in the Maitreyi Upanishad, which says, Deho Devalaya Proktaha. The body itself is the Devalaya. Devalaya is not an external structure. Our own bodies is where divinity can reside. It does reside in our body. So everything is a Devalaya for us. So therefore, the limited definition of the textbook definition that we see today as house of God. It's not an external structure, which is the house of God, but everything is the house of God. There is nothing where God does not reside. So this broader definition of what a temple is, we'll always need to keep in mind. And also the other question is, it's a religious structure like the church and the mosque. So this is again a textbook definition, which we find in several Indian social science uh, textbooks today. But then, for us, the temple is not merely a religious structure. Even if you consider the structural temples, the temple image that I have shown here is the Brihadishwara temple. It's not merely you're going there out of devotion or anything, uh, something like that. It's a place where multi-dimensional activities take place. For example, the temples were the seeds of justice in the past until about 150 years. The kings used to go there for 10,000 years. Kings have gone there and they have given justice to people or they have uh, declared their law to their masses, to their citizens, right at the feet of the God. So the impression there is, I am just a material king for you all. The real king of the people is the divinity. So I'm just an instrument in the hands of the divinity. And it's through him that I'm speaking. It's he, through me, he's making me speak. He's speaking through me. So it was a seat of justice. And even until very recent days, 
whenever there was a flood, whenever there was a pandemic, whenever there was any kind of plague or cholera or any of these uh, kind of epidemic diseases, people could get housed in the temples. The temple used to have a very huge compound, a very huge prakara, and the temples used to have in their treasury all the money or whatever valuables they have got, they would give it for the welfare of the society. And they would have got their own granary where a lot of grains and a lot of food uh, substances would have been stored that would be used for the welfare of the people. So it was catering for the material needs of the people, such as food, and giving shelter for people who were in needs, shelter for people who were traveling, and even clothing, food, shelter, and clothing for all people whenever necessary. It was a dynamic system which it could provide that way. And the temple, like many of you might know, that is where all the Indian art forms developed, be it dance or music or sculpture or painting. That's one place where everything came together. And even today, you might have heard that during the Corona lockdown period in the uh, months of March, April and May, when temples were cl closed down, many people lost their employment. It could be the flower vendors, it could be the vegetable vendors, the fruit vendors, the prasadam makers who make uh, the food substances in the temple premises, the sweepers, the architects, the purohits, the purohits are the ones who do all the ritualistic puja, etc. in the temples. Many of them lost their livelihood or at least temporarily there was a pause in their livelihood. So the temple caters to the livelihoods of so many people. It uh, caters to the psychological and emotional and physical comfort of so many people. And it caters to the artistic needs of people. That's one place where many of us can relate. Myself, I'm a native of Bangalore. In the Basmangudi area, there are so many very old temples. In my childhood, I could go there and listen to the Harikatha programs. I could see the dance programs. I could visit the bhajans and all that. It would give a very good cultural backing for uh, people, for youngsters, to connect to the time immemorial or timeless Indian tradition. So it's one place where several things could happen. It's not just a religious structure. That's a very, very limited sense of meaning. So the two things that I just mentioned was the temple can be realized anywhere. And even if you take the temple as a physical structure, it's not merely a religious center. It, it's a multidimensional center, which has several different uh, dimensions to it. Now, let me quickly enumerate the root word meaning of Devalaya. Devalaya is the Sanskrit word for temple. Temple is an English word, very obviously based in the Latin language. Devalaya is what the Sanskrit uh, original word. So it can be broken up into two parts, Deva plus Alaya. So the word Alaya, Laya, means where you can dissolve, you can lose yourself, where you can forget yourself. A place where you can forget yourself and you can have the elements of Krida, Vijigisha, Vyavahara, Jyuti, Stuti, Moda, Mada, Swapna, Kanti, Gati. All these are the elements which the temple will make you do. It will make you peaceful. It will make you happy. It will give you the confidence that you can do positive things in life. It's where all the material, emotional and spiritual activities take place. Vyavahara. Jyuti, that is where you'll get the brilliance of knowledge. Like many of you know, for thousands of years, several of the gurukulas or the patashalas existed in the temple compounds. Within the temple uh, structure, several of the education systems existed. It's not just the spiritual education. Astronomy was taught, mathematics was taught, agriculture was taught, architecture was taught. See, the wonders of the temples, I'll uh, soon show some of them, that shows that Indians had a lot of technology, extraordinary technology. All of that was taught in the temples, in the traditional, in the Maukika Parampara, in the oral tradition, from the teacher to the student, the knowledge used to be passed on. See, back then, it was difficult to document things. How do you write? Where do you write? Even if you write it on the barks of trees or on uh, dried leaves of uh, trees, how to preserve it? How to propagate the books? So there was a lot of difficulty. So a lot of knowledge in all ancient civilizations, not just India, in Greece, in Egypt, and in uh, ancient Japan, I'm sure. There was oral tradition through which the knowledge was passed on until about 100 or 150 years back, until Gutenberg introduced this printing press. Oral tradition was very uh, popular.
So in the oral tradition, education system existed within the temple complex. So the word duty, it gives you the brilliance of knowledge. It is the place of stuti. If you want, if you are an if you are a theist, if you believe in some higher authority, if you believe in God, then you could go and express your gratitude to divinity there for all the benefits that He has given you, or you could uh, uh, give your request there of what. Uh, are the things that you would want or what uh, kind of comforts you want. So that was a psychological center. See, this uh, psychiatric uh, treatment and all that was not an exclusive thing in India. It was all integrated in the temple system, in the joint family system and all that. It's a very new phenomenon, uh, the psychological counseling and all that, that used to naturally happen in such ecosystems, such as the temples, where several people from different walks of life will come together to cater to the needs of several different kinds of people. So in summary, the very word Devalaya from its root meaning means a place where man completely dissolves into something that transcends the physical and the mental plane, where you lose yourself. There is nothing else to bother about, where several of your needs, your educational needs, your material needs, emotional needs and spiritual needs, all of them are met. So that is a temple. See, I've just shown the uh, example of the Arunachala mountain here and the Triveni Sangama, the Ganga Yamuna and the Saraswati Sangama in uh, today's Prayagaraja. It was previously called Allahabad for a few years. Then today it's renamed as uh, Tirtharaja or Prayagaraja. See, here the mountain itself is the temple for us in Arunachala. So many of you might know the tradition of going around the mountain itself. The mountain uh, the Giri Pradikshina it is called or Giri Valam it is called. The mountain itself is the Linga for us. It's not the physical structure which matters but the mountain itself is the Linga. And here this Triveni Sangama taking a dip there itself is like worshipping divinity. It's being immersed in divinity in a sense. So anything where this Krida Vijigisha where playfulness can happen where you can completely forget yourself all of them can be Devalaya in our Indian conception. Okay. Anyway, now quickly proceeding on to, on to this structural entities called temples that we see in uh, India today. Amongst the oldest freely standing structures that we find in India are the stupas, chaityas and viharas, which the Buddhists built. The Buddhists are not very different from the Sanatana Samskriti. They are an offshoot, a philosophical offshoot of the mainstream so-called Hinduism, which we today broadly refer to as Hinduism. They are just offshoots of the mainstream Hindus. And they built these structures called stupas. Stupas are where an element of a Bauddha bhikshu or a Bauddha sannyasi is stored. For example, the tooth of Buddha can be stored here. Or one strand of hair of Buddha would be stored here. Or the bhiksha patra that Buddha used to use, Gautama Buddha used to use, would be stored here. So it's called the Datu Garbha. Again, it's in a sense, the Guru's elements, the relics of the Guru or the dhatu of the Guru. One element of the Guru is put in here and it's worshipped and it's prayed to. As he is the giver of knowledge, he is the one who enlightened us. So this is these are the oldest structures which are surviving today. But just see the marvel here. It is not at all easy to construct a semi-spherical, a semi-circular dome like this using stone. From all of a sudden, you can't build this. This, is, this dates back to about uh, 3rd century BC, which is about 2300 or 2400 years old. To arrive at a structure like this, they must have had a long tradition. A lot of trials and errors must have happened until they perfected a structure like this, until they perfected building a structure like this. So these tupas, chaityas and viharas from the Buddhist period are amongst the oldest structures remaining to us today. Several of the ancient temples have been destroyed mainly because of the invasions which uh, happened uh, time and again uh, from the Western world. The Islamic invasion of Muhammad Ghazni and Muhammad Ghori and several of them and the British invasion which happened destroyed several of the Indian monuments. That's a different topic altogether. I won't uh, get in there. But we get to know that there were several ancient temples which were wood, uh, built out of wood, they were built out of stone and several other materials. <clears throat> Similarly, in the ancient period, we also find cave temples dating to about 2300 years back. This is a cave temple from Karla in the Maharashtra region, in the Lonavala. 
it's a naturally existing cave and look at the perfection and symmetry that they have achieved in sculpting out the pillars here and the roof and all that see if at least in a freely stranding structure if you make an error you can redo the work you can reconstruct it but this is a cave temple it is a naturally existing cave every inch every millimeter you'll have to have perfection you'll have to have a perfect vision of what you are bringing out and just imagine it is it is the face of a rock a face of a mountain they have to carve inside it they have they'll have to dig out the mountain facade and they'll have to make a cave temple like this imagine the kind of effort and kind of technology they might have had and the perfection with which they must have worked to come up with a structure like this such as the karla caves which we find in the lunawala region so this is a, this is called a chaitya Chaitya is where several Buddhist monks come together. They have their classes, they have their debates and discussions here. And what you find in the middle here is called a stupa. Stupa is again where an element of a Buddhist monk or a Buddhist sannyasi is stored. Uh, that uh, what you see there in the middle is the stu is the stupa. The entire area is called the Chaitya. And look at the detail with which a cave temple in Ajanta is uh, carved. The intricate details in the sculptures here and the pillars and this window, all of these are very beautiful. So uh, the workmanship and the effort and the brilliance of their vision that they must have had is kind of evidently standing in front of our eyes. It need not be even exaggerated. And now amongst the oldest freely standing Hindu temples that we find, date back to about uh, 600 CE, which is the common era, that uh, is about 1500 years old. These are called the Pancharatas or the Pandavaratas, which we find in Mahabalipuram. Here uh, you have five temples. Uh, uh, this one, the first one is the Draupadi Ratha, the second one is the Arjuna Ratha, the third is the Bhima. What you see there at, at the back is the Dharmaraja Ratha. This is the Nakula Sahadeva Ratha. So these are the first instances of freely standing stone temples available to us today. Before that, there were definitely uh, wooden temples, which we have lost due to, it could be due to natural accidents, like fire accidents or lightning striking it, or due to rains, or durability of wood is much lesser compared to stone. So in the last uh, 5,500 to 2,000 years, we find that stone structures were being built. See, the perfection with which they, uh, they have built it already shows that they must have had a lot of experience. A lot of waters must have flowed already for them to have achieved this kind of perfection in building these uh, structures. There are largely three kinds of temple styles that we find throughout India. There is the North Indian temple style, which is called the Nagara. The South Indian temple style, which is called the Dravida. And a mixture of the North Indian and uh, South Indian temple styles, which is called the Vesara. Vesara itself means a mixture. It's like you have a no we have a set of North Indian languages, you have a set of South Indian languages, and you have a mixture of North Indian and South Indian styles. Again, throughout India, you see a lot of variety. The North Indian distinct style in different regions is very different. Their food styles are different. In South India, you have different styles of languages, food styles, and dressing uh, styles, etc. Similarly, there are two different kinds of temple styles, the Nagara and the Dravida and a mixture style called the Vesara. Let me quickly give examples for them. One of the examples, uh, one of the features of the Nagara style is that this, what you find here at the top left, is a temple from Orissa, from Bhuvaneshwar. In the Nagara style, you have a vertical uh, uh, symmetry. See, from the bottom till the top of this Garbhagruha, this main portion, which is called the Vimana, you find that the structure follows a straight line. Many of the North Indian temples will have this kind of structure for the Garbhagruha or the main place where the main deity is housed. So this is the Nagara style of temple, which is found in the no North India. Most North Indian temples are of this kind. A Dravida kind of temple, what you find in Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu largely, will have a stepped pyramidal structure. See, you see that this is pyramid. It's pyramidal. And you have steps here. Stepped pyramidal structure is uh, the signature aspect of the South Indian temples. In North India, you have straight lines which are pronounced. In, in the South India, you have horizontal lines which are pronounced. It's just the difference in taste. 
one cannot ask questions why do we have these uh, different styles why do people speak malayalam in uh, kerala why do people speak gujarati in gujarat you can't ask such questions they are just regional tastes which have uh, developed and a mixture of the two tastes where you have pronounced straight lines as well as uh, horizontal striations this is called the vesara which is the mixture of nagara and dravida these are broadly the three largely uh, the three different styles of temple construction we find throughout india there are several examples for dravida temples this is uh, something very close to bangalore this is the boganandeeshwara beyond bangalore airport you have this nandi hills at the foot of the nandi hills you have this temple a brilliant structure a beautiful structure it has all the components of temples and anybody who is interested in studying the architecture the sculpture and the temple ecosystem this is a very good place to go a very beautiful pyramidal structure of the vimana or the main part of the temple the garbhagriha is very well seen here and what you see here is uh, from a, is about 1000 years old it is the brihadeeshwara temple of tanjavur which was built by raja raja chola what is very interesting about this temple is that the entire temple complex is built of granite and this main portion which houses the shivalinga this is called the vimana just see the topmost portion which is called the shikara this topmost portion that is the shikara that <coughs> uh, that piece of stone that piece of rock itself is 90 tons just this the stone the topmost portion is 90 tons and another interesting thing is that there are no granite mountains anywhere in the vicinity of tanjavur in the 100 km radius of tanjavur you do not have mountains which can provide granite we don't know how they transported the granite from uh, mountains which were 100 km away more than 100 km away they brought it to this place and built these heavy structures and what's the other amazing thing about this structure is that the foundation foundation which is usually below the soil level that is not deep at all it is only a few inches the foundation is very shallow the superstructure this entire the topmost structure is 90 tons this entire structure is about 150 tons they say 150000 kgs this huge heavy structure with very little foundation it's been standing for 1000 years now so one can see the architectural marvel and the technological marvel that uh, the indians must have had back then and they have got very intricate carvings and several uh, intricate sculptures throughout this i won't have much time to cover all of that but uh, it's an amazing thing i mean amazing feat uh, which is achieved by the uh, native indians and this is the what you see on the right side is the rajendra chola's brihadeeshwara temple which he has built in the gangai kondu cholapuram he has tried to imitate the father's temple and he has also improvised upon it see the father built the temple in straight lines and in a pyramidal structure here he has brought a curvature in architecture if you see here so that's his improvisation which the son has done he has tried to bring beauty in architecture so there are several such marvels another extraordinary marvel is this kailasa rashtrakuta period it dates back to about uh, 7th or 8th century ce that is about 1300 1400 years back what's interesting about this is that whereas the brihadeeshwara temple is built on a flat piece of land from the ground level they have built it top words this temple is not a constructed temple this entire thing was a mountain from the mountain from top to bottom they have carved a temple just see the imagination they must have had at every level they have got precision and to imagine a structure from top to bottom and building it from top to bottom is a very difficult feat which they have beautifully achieved in this uh, temple the rashtrakuta temple see whereas in the brihadeeshwara temple if a mistake happens a stone slab can be replaced but this is a rock cut temple the kailasanatha temple where nothing can be replaced you are carving it out of a mountain it's not that they brought rocks from somewhere and built it here it was a mountain from the mountain they sculpted out this temple from top to bottom again a very beautiful dravida temple which you see here uh, very interesting structure 
So this is another perspective. See, they have got several elements of the temple brought in here. The, you have the Dvajas Tamba, which is here prominently seen. You have different elements of the temple, which are very prominently seen here. And from what you can see from the background, that is actually the slopes of a mountain from which they have carved out this temple. That's quite visible from the background. Okay, so these are examples for South Indian temples where you largely have a stepped pyramidal structure for the main uh, Vimana. This uh, structure is called the Vimana. You have a stepped pyramidal structure. And North Indian temples, such as uh, the temples in Orissa or in Kajuravo in Madhya Pradesh and Gujarat, you have the straight line structures. This is called the Nagara kind of architecture. That's also a very interesting uh, style and uh, uh, very beautiful style. Another very interesting thing is the Hoysala temples, which are which I mentioned, were belong to the category called the Vesara temples. What, what, there are several interesting features of the Hoysala temples, but what's one interesting thing? Here is these pillars. Just look at these pillars. They have so much of cylindrical symmetry, which was built thousand years back. So how did they? This is a granite. Most of them are built of granite. Many of them are built of soapstone also. So how did they actually carve out such concentric stuff in these pillars? Again, a marble. So they had something like the lathe technology back then, out of which they carved out these uh, kind of uh, pillars. And the intricate carvings in uh, the uh, uh, in the temple sculptures, that's another different study altogether. Another very interesting feature in the post Hoysala period, which is in the Vijayanagar period, is that you, uh, in Hampi region in Karnataka, you have these temples where you have musical pillars. So we have heard of instruments like veena or guitar or violin, where strings are used to produce music. Or we have bamboo instruments like flute, or you have wind instruments like saxophone, etc., which can produce music. But here stones can sing, stones can produce music. So just imagine how they would have arrived at this. The Sari, Gama, Padani, all the Saptasvaras can be brought out of stone. Some of you might have visited this place where if you tap on these pillars, different kinds of Swaras can be brought in. So when the Devadasis were dancing, Devadasis are temple dancers, when they used to dance in front of the deity as an offering to the deity, there would be singers and this would work as the background musical instrument, the temple pillars itself would produce music. These are extraordinary architectural and sculptural feats of the Indians. And today, unfortunately, there is a tendency to say that these structures were built by aliens. So some people from Mars or people from Proxima Galaxy, Proxima Century, they came and built this. So that's the tendency of especially some Western scholars to say it. So what it shows is that they are underestimating the, <laughs> the skill of Indians or the talent of Indians. Why can't we accept that it is possible for a human mind to do something extraordinary like this? If they have come up with things like plastic surgery and uh, uh, extraordinary mathematics back in India, Aryabhata or Sushruta or Vagbata and people like that, when they have come up with such beautiful raga system, which is unmatched in the world, like the music system in the world, uh, the Indian music system is cannot be competed by any other music system in the world. When so many intellectual pursuits are possible, why not a physical structure uh, pursuit like this? It's definitely possible. It's definitely possible for the human mind. It's definitely not built by the aliens because we have several shastras which document the methodology and the means uh, of building these kind of temples. Anyway, we should always be aware when such uh, kind of uh, intrusions and uh, misinterpretations are being done on the Indian culture, we must have proper answers to give back to all Western intologists when they make such comments. Now, it's not just in the mainland India that you find such temples. In the bigger India, India is geographically small today. But if you go back in time, 72 or 73 years, so India was much bigger. Pakistan and Bangladesh were parts of India. Similarly, if you go back in time, Indian culture or the Sanatana Samskriti, it had a very wide expanse starting from Iran or even Greece in the West until Japan in the East. The Indian culture had a wide appeal and a wide following, which a wide it was widely practiced. So you have this Prambadan temple in Java, Indonesia, even today, extraordinary uh, uh, temple, a very beautiful temple. It's a Trimurti temple. 
in the middle you have the shrine dedicated to uh, shiva on either side you have uh, brahma and vishnu this is the aerial view look at the aerial symmetry that they have got see did they even fly up there to imagine all these symmetry it's a uh, the, there is a perfect symmetry in the placing and the spacing of all these elements you can see from the aerial uh, perspective the trimurti temples and their vahanas their vehicles as in shiva's vahana is nandi and brahma's uh, vahana is the swan or the hamsa and uh, vishnu's vahana is the garuda you have the uh, vahana mandiras also the three smaller shrines that you see here so you have such temples and you have the angkor wat which is in cambodia it's the largest religious monument or a temple complex in the world which is found outside today's indian political borders but the angkor wat or cambodia was a, uh, was a culture was culturally a part of the indian civilization in the past it's called the akhand bharat or the brihat bharat it was a part of the bigger indian subcontinent so you have the extraordinary temple of this angkor wat uh, situated there in cambodia see look at the finesse in uh, the planning here the middle po portion is the actual temple and there was an entire city surrounding uh, this temple the temple was the nucleus of uh, the angkor uh, wat that complex and around that you have a moat a water body to protect the city and the temple very good planning very good city planning and very good architecture a very good city management all of that we had in the past if you see chanakya sarta shastra if you go through the mahabharata if you go through the original mahabharata you will get a lot of insights about administration about governance about city planning and the duties of a king the duties of ministers and all that is very beautifully documented anyway similarly you have several beautiful temples even outside india and sri lata ji keeps telling me about the temples that she comes across in japan so we see that the indian culture had a very vast and a very huge uh, influence both in the temporal and the spatial uh, coordinates in the spatio temporal frames indians had a very huge impact okay so that's largely about the architecture there is just one other thing which i'll quickly tell the complete temple system it matches the human body the gopura which is the entire uh, the the proportions of the human body they are very well maintained in the temple in both the latitudinal uh, section and the longitudinal section so if you see look at this image most of you can will be able to know i think i'm almost running out of time so the entire Sir, structure you can take your time don't uh, i mean uh, speed up for the sake of time uh, oh, no, no, right just in about 5 uh, minutes sir. no problem yeah, yeah. don't don't bother about time because okay, you, have, okay. you have kept the audience gripped ah, okay okay i'm pleased okay thank you uh so if a human being uh, sleeps the proportions between his body parts that's the same kind of proportions you see in the construction of a temple so you might remember the very first statement that i said deho devalaya prokta the entire body is the residence of divinity the manifest the external manifestation of the human body can be imagined as the temple complex so the gopura corresponds to the feet of a human body or the feet of the deity if you imagine the god itself sleeping there that corresponds to the feet and the dwajastamba corresponds to the genital area of uh, the deity of the human or the human being the balipita corresponds to the abdomen uh, region the the vahana mantapa that corresponds to the navel region and the guda mantapa or the navaranga or the maha mantapa that corresponds to the heart region and the main deity wherever the main deity is housed which is called the garbhagruha or the sanctum sanctorum that corresponds to the pituitary gland or the brahmarendra uh, uh, the sahasrara of the uh, human being see it's very interesting the balipita it corresponds to the stomach what is the function of the balipita balipita is where once the naivedya offering to the god is done the prasada is distributed to the entire world that is the function of the balipita so that corresponds to the stomach very meaningful the prasada is a very god of the stomach finally and this mahamantapa or navaranga is where different art forms are practiced it could be a musical form it could be a dance form it could be a harikatha it could be a lecture that goes on there that will immediately connect to the heart of the audience so that corresponds to the heart and this agnya chakra or the brahmarendra that corresponds to the main place where the deity deity is placed which is called the garbhagruha all of these terms have a lot of meaning lot of symbology there 
I'll need uh, at least 35 hours to get into all of these details. Like I said, I'm doing a separate course uh, uh, to give, to dwell into details of all of these. So that's about the latitudinal structure, the horizontal structure of the temple. Even in the vertical structure and the, lo the longitudinal structure, we see that it has, it follows the proportions of the human body. It proposed a, pro uh, follows the proportions of a deity seated. In fact, several of the names of the temple parts are same as the names of the human body. See, for instance, this portion of the temple is called the griva, griva or the kanta. It corresponds exactly to the neck region of a deity. Griva or kanta is the neck in the Sanskrit language. The upper portion is called the shikara. Shikara itself means the head. That corresponds in proportions to the head of the deity. The lower portions, this uh, segment is called the janga. Janga means uh, the leg, the portion of the leg. And there's a uh, segment in the temple called the janu, which corresponds to the knee of the deity. So in the vertical proportions and in the horizontal proportions, it is modeled after a human body. That's a very interesting architectural uh, factor. Now, there are several interesting sculptural factors uh, when we talk about the temples. There are musical factors, there are dance related factors. I'll just throw light on one element, one of the sculptures here. This is from Badami. Many of you might recognize this. This is the Varaha, Bhu Varaha Murti. Varaha who is rescuing, re rescuing earth from the Pralaya Jala. There was the flood which was eating up the earth, it was, which was eating up, up the universe, according to the Indian Puranas. And Varaha, which is Vishnu, he takes uh, the form of this boar and he lifts up the earth. Look at the very intricate uh, thing that they have done. It's a cave temple, by the way. They are Badami caves. And in, on one of the walls of the Badami cave, you find this sculpture. Unfortunately, the sculptor, while sculpting this, he found that the lower segments of this uh, wall has some styrations here. So he very intelligently employed the natural styrations which are present on the wall to depict water. So this depicts water already. It's naturally present in the cave. He intelligently, creatively employed it to depict the Varaha Murti. So this much is the water. And here you see that this is the Bhudevi whom the Varaha is lifting up. And his snout, his nose portion is in the air. You see the flying deities here. They have brought in the water levels, the uh, the level of the earth and the level of the skies in one sculpture. It actually shows the dimensions, the huge dimension that the Varaha would have occupied. His feet is in the water, below the surface of the water. You see, you see several water deities or Nagas here below the water level. And this styrations it, itself indicates the water. And his nose is in the aerial level. You see, you see these demigods flying here. So these are some of the artistic improvisations they have made based on the material or based on the rock that they have got. They have sculpted beautiful Puranic stories. See, today we have movies. You, you have uh, color books and animated uh, cartoons, etc. to tell stories. But back then, you, you had to tell stories in the oral medium or you could take them to temples and they could see in static animation. So these are used to tell temples, to help children and also adults to visualize different kinds of stories. And all of these stories have a value, a value which is applicable to our own lives, our day-to-day -day lives. So we see several such very beautiful sculptures present in all our temples, even today. Look at the very beautiful intricate carvings that are present in a Hoysala temple, for instance. Another temple where a dynamism is captured. See, a temple sculpture is never static. This is an elephant in movement. You can see nobody, no elephant stands like this. It's a moment of the movement. It's like taking a photograph of an elephant in movement. And look at this person. This is Dima actually. He's attacking this elephant called Supratika. He has jumped in the air. That also you see here. Uh, he's flying up in the air. So these are dynamic moments which the sculptures carry, uh, which uh, the sculptures portray. So if you see a panel of sculptures, you'll be able to build a story. There's a, uh, there's a chronology in the sculptures that we see in uh, several of our temples. So these were dynamic rep representations of storytelling tradition of India. So that was a very brief introduction to the entire temple tradition. 
it was a huge ecosystem which catered to the emotions and the needs and the physical and the spiritual requirements of people from different walks of life even today a temple caters to the needs of people from different walks of life so it's very important for us to realize the importance of temple as the nucleus of the indian system indian uh, society so it's not just the indians who uh, realize the importance of the temples but even the foreign invaders any foreigner who came to india he first ransacked the temple because most of them realized that the temple is the heart of the indian culture so if you attack the heart of the culture then the entire culture can be destroyed so with that intention several people attacked it but we still had the several temples even now surviving and the sanatana dharma has survived for several thousands of years it is immemorial from times immemorial it has survived so it's very important to understand the importance of the spiritual the emotional and the physical dimensions of the temple ecosystem this was just a brief trailer of uh, in a sense so people who are interested we can have uh, more detailed discussions at a, at a further point in time most thanks a lot amazing, the, most amazing actually the audience was really gripped there are a lot of encomiums for you i request uh, madam to take charge yeah thanks a lot uh, thank you arjun ji for this wonderful talk no matter how many times i listen to your uh, lecture i i'm again and again impressed by this uh, our rich heritage so if there are any questions uh there are no the, particular uh, okay, dr girish dr girish has a question please yeah. um thank thank you very much uh, arjun for this uh, really wonderful uh, you know i i know it's just a glimpse which you have given i'm sure you have done a really in depth study into our great uh, heritage our great temples and i'm sure we would love to uh, have you with us at some point of time in the future to go into the details of how our temples have been constructed and uh, explain to us uh, the greatness of our sanata dharma uh, i have one uh, question for you um, you know they say that uh, all the temples are basically uh, points of energy right um, that is where the highest concentration of energy uh, sources are and then we have seen that uh, there are lines longitudinal and latitudinal lines in which most of these temples have all been built across the country can you you know share some thoughts on what these energy points are and how they have come to that uh, kind of uh, areas how they have actually in the past identified these uh, energy points and built specific temples in these kind of areas yeah thanks a lot for your question sir uh there are several puranic stories regarding this where how in what piece of land what kind of temple needs to be constructed and to what deity the temple needs to be dedicated to and around the temple you will see like if you go around uh, like a pradikshin and temple you see the deities in different uh, places in on the walls of the temple and also on the vimana you'll find different deities are placed so there's an entire puranic story behind it which is uh, the story of the vastu purusha the entire structure of the temple that's a very detailed uh, discussion to get into the story i have even got slides uh, regarding this and shrilata ji has uh, sat through uh, a couple of those sessions where i have explained the construction of the temple and the selection of the site and all that this is too brief a session for me to get into those details maybe i'll have to dedicate another session for it i'm sorry about it or maybe i can even give you reference materials where you can quickly uh, relate to the details yeah. absolutely definitely i'll get in touch with you regarding that yeah. thank you okay. thank you okay. thank you there is one question again asking about the significance of vastu purusha mandala uh, that's uh, exactly what i just uh, uh, yeah. said um so, i'll need at least half an hour to get into that we'll take it up in another session for oh, sure oh. or i'll give you reference material There, oh. there are several many reference materials available online okay yeah, yeah you know sri lata ji you could collect the questions and pass it on to me whatever i can answer briefly i'll just reply to you on whatsapp yeah. or something and you can sure. pass on the answers if sure, it requires because... a detailed discussion i can just point them to reference material or authentic videos on youtube or something see because today anybody can speak anything and put it on youtube and they can write anything and post it online many of those things are not authentic there is uh, hardly any credibility there so again i could help you discover more credible and authentic stuff whatever among the resources that are present online 
Okay, sure. Right. That would be good. Right. Yeah. Uh, any more questions by anyone? Uh, Dr. Nagesh, do you have anything to ask? Um, anyway, most of the participants have really appreciated your talk. And they loved your presentation. It like they're saying it was very eloquent and flawless presentation, and uh, they could understand the depth of knowledge that you had, and that you have shared today. So everyone was very appreciative. Um, so Dr. Nagesh, are you there online? Okay. Uh, Huh. Okay, so usually, like most of us, we visit the temples as either tourists or as devotees. And I'm sure this brilliant uh, presentation by uh, Sri Arjun Bharadwaj uh, has given us an entirely different uh, perspective of temples. And uh, we should take great pride in our temples and our heritage. So uh, I now call upon Dr. Shambhu to give uh, express a vote of thanks on behalf of Sasomi. Dr. Shambhu? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Shilata. I, Dr. Shambhu H.S., uh, on behalf of Saho Sasami, extend a hearty word of thanks to our guest, Dr. Uh, uh, Mr. Sri Arjun Bharadwaj, who spared his time on his busy, busy schedule and also actually is, he shared his immense knowledge about the temples. And actually, I, was, I didn't know that actually we, we had uh, North Indian style, South Indians like Nesara, Dravida, and Vesara style. It was very, although actually we visit a lot of temples. Although actually, I, I, I used to think that there are different kinds of uh, things. This, this was a basic for me. When I visit the temple next, actually, probably I'll be uh, uh, I'll be seeing them much closely. Thank you for that. And uh, and I, 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 my sincere gratitude to all the attendees to, for gracing that occasion in the platform. A special thanks to the collaborator group pharmaceuticals and the people who work behind the program. And thank you, my uh, uh, teachers. Dr. Nagesh, Dr. Girish, uh, and Sri Lata. Thank you all. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful session. And uh, I request, uh, sir, uh, if you have your email ID, you can type here, Arjun, sir. Because, ah, uh, yes, there, sure. There uh, it's uh, very simple, arjunbharadwaj at gmail.com. Yeah, yeah, because people are asking, yeah. probably they will be in touch with you. Sure, yeah, I can give my that. phone number also. You can. Yeah, yeah, uh, please contact. type. <laughs> That was uh, nice of you because yeah, people sure. have been asking for contacting you. Yeah, that I think yeah, I uh, typed it. I don't know if it appeared there in the yes, chat. Yes, yes, yeah, it, it's 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 it appeared. Okay, okay, yeah. fine, fine. So I request attendees right. to take note of the email ID as well as the phone number. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. It was an awesome. Thank you, Sasomi, for giving us an opportunity to collaborate with you. And I think. Yeah, uh, I'll just say a few words. Yeah. Again, uh, thank you all for attending this uh, webinar. So our next webinar will be on 11th October uh, on Sunday and uh, it will be on the professional development series and it's titled Pro Physiology and Biochemistry of Yoga for Dentists. So hope to see all of you there and thank you once again. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Yeah.